we will spend the first few lectures gathering together information on the conditions that are necessary in order for agriculture to thrive. We will then be able to draw conclusions for the actual practice of agriculture, conclusions that should be put into practice and that only have meaning in practice. Thus, in these first lectures, we will have to study how the products of agriculture actually come into existence and what part they play in the world as a whole. Now, a farm comes closest to its own essence when it can be conceived of as a kind of independent individuality, a self-contained entity. In reality, every farm ought to aspire to this state of being, a self-contained individuality. This state cannot be achieved completely, but it needs to be approached. This means that within our farms we should attempt to have everything we need for agricultural production, including, of course, the appropriate amount of livestock. From the perspective of an ideal farm, any fertilizers and so forth that are brought in from outside would indeed have to be regarded as remedies for a sickened farm. A healthy farm would be one that could produce everything it needs from within itself. We shall see in a moment why this is so. As long as the essential being and reality of things is not taken into account, but only their outer material aspect, it is quite understandable that people believe it makes no difference whether farmers get their cow manure from the neighbor's farm or from their own farm. As I said, these things cannot be strictly implemented, but if we want to organize things appropriately, we must still realize how necessary it is for a farm to be self-contained. This assertion will acquire a certain justification if we look, on the one hand, at the earth from which our agriculture springs, and on the other hand at what influences the earth from outside. People nowadays tend to talk very abstractly about outside influences on the earth. They are aware that the sun's light and warmth, and everything meteorologically related to these, are connected in some way to the condition of a crop producing soil. But present-day ideas cannot properly explain this because they do not penetrate to the realities, to the real facts. Let us begin today from the point of view that takes the soil as the foundation of agriculture, and then later we will also look at things from other points of view. We usually think of the soil, which I am going to indicate here with this line, as being something purely mineral, with organic matter coming into it only incidentally to the extent that humus develops or manure is applied. That the soil might contain not only this sort of life, but also an inherent plant-like vitality, and even something of the nature of soul qualities, this is not even conceived of, much less accepted as fact. And if we go even further, and see how this inner life of the soil, in terms of its fine dosages, I would like to say, is quite different in summer than in winter, we then get into domains that are of tremendous significance for practical life, but which at present are not taken into account at all. Indeed, if we take the soil as our point of departure, we will have to recognize that the soil functions as a kind of organ within the organism that reveals wherever in nature there is growth. <coughs> the soil is a real organ, an organ we might want to compare to the human diaphragm. We get a proper idea of what is present there if we picture that certain organs in a human being are located above the diaphragm, especially the head and everything that provides for the head through respiration and circulation, while others are located below it. The comparison is not quite exact, but for purposes of illustration it is good enough. If we compare the soil to a human diaphragm, we then have to say that the head of the individuality in question is underground and that we and all our farm animals are living in its belly. Everything above ground actually belongs to the bowels of this, we can say, agricultural individuality. When we walk around a farm, we are actually walking through its belly and the plants are growing up into its belly. This individuality is standing on its head, 
We only look at it correctly when we imagine that with regard to a human being it is standing on its head. With regard to animals it's somewhat different, as we'll see in the course of these lectures. Now why do I say the agricultural individuality is standing on its head? I say this because what is in the immediate vicinity to the earth the air, water vapors, and warmth in which we live and breathe and from which the plants also get their outer warmth, air, and water, this corresponds in fact to the human being's abdominal organs. Conversely, everything happening below ground has an effect on plant growth that is similar to the effect that our head has on our body, most notably during childhood but also to some extent throughout life. A lively interchange is constantly taking place between what is above ground and what is below ground. In addition, we can say that the above ground activity is directly dependent on the Moon, Mercury and Venus as they support and modify the influence of the Sun. Consider this for the time being as a localization of the planetary influences. These so-called near-Earth planets have an effect on everything above the surface of the soil. In contrast, the distant planets, those beyond the Sun's orbit, work on everything beneath the soil and support those influences that the Sun exercises from below. <coughs> as far as plant growth is concerned, we must look underground for the effects of the distant heavens and above ground for the effects of the Earth's more immediate environment. Thus what comes from the expanses of the universe and affects plant growth does not work directly through direct radiation but by first being absorbed by the ground and then radiated upward. Beneficial or detrimental influences on plant growth that come from the ground are actually cosmic influences radiating back upward. On the other hand, the direct radiation at work in the air and water above the ground is stored up above and takes effect from there. This interacts with the effect that the inner constitution of the ground has on the plant growth. Later we will have to widen this picture to include the effects on animals. To begin with, what we meet in the soil are all the effects that depend on the most distant reaches of the universe insofar as these concern the earth. There we find what we commonly call sand and rocks. Sand and rocks, although impervious to water and said to contain no nutrients, are actually no less important for plant growth than the other factor that is relevant here. They are in fact extremely important for the processes of growth because they convey forces from the furthest reaches of the universe. Unlikely as it may seem, it is especially by means of the silica containing sand that the life ether and chemical ether, as we can call them, first enter into the soil and then take effect as they stream back upward. The extent to which the soil itself becomes alive and develops its own chemistry depends primarily on the sandy component of the soil. The conditions encountered by plant roots in the soil are greatly influenced by the extent to which the cosmic life and cosmic chemistry are collected by the rock and stone, which for this purpose need to be present only at considerable depths. Whenever plant growth is studied, it is important to know the geological stratum beneath the plants. And with plants whose roots are of particular interest or importance, we should never forget that silica is indispensable, even if it is present only in the depths. Silica, thank God, is very widespread on the earth. Forty-seven to forty-eight percent of everything consists of silica in the form of silicic acid and other silica compounds so we can almost always count on enough silica being present to have the desired effect. The next thing to consider is how the forces brought into relationship with the plant roots by silica can be led up through the plant. These influences must stream upward. There must be a constant interplay 
between what is drawn in from the universe through silica and what goes on up there in the belly, which also nourishes the head down below. Although the head must be provided for out of the universe, it must also truly interact with what is occurring in the belly up above. What is collected down below from the cosmos must always be able to stream upward, and the presence of clay in the soil makes this possible. Substances like clay support the upward flow of the effects of the cosmic entities in the ground. Once we get down to practice, knowing this will help us deal with clay soils or sandy soils in accordance with the kind of crop we want to grow there. But first we need to know what is really going on. However else clay may be described, however else we must treat it so that it becomes fertile, all this is of secondary importance. The primary thing we need to know is that clay promotes the upward stream of the cosmic factor. <coughs> but this cosmic upward stream is not the only thing to be considered. Everything going on in the belly, in the air above ground, consists, constitutes excuse me, a kind of digestion for the plants. And this digestion, I will call it the terrestrial or earthly factor, must be drawn down into the ground so that a real interplay takes place. All the forces and fine homeopathic substances produced by means of the water and air above ground are drawn down by the soil's greater or lesser content of lime. It is the lime in the soil and the presence of calcareous substances in homeopathic doses just above the soil's surface that serve to draw this terrestrial factor down into the ground. You see, everything will look quite different once we have a real science of these things in place of the meaningless talk that currently passes for science. Then we will be able to give exact details about these things. Then we will know, for instance, that there is a huge difference between the above-ground warmth that is in the domain of Sun, Venus, Mercury and Moon and the kind of warmth that is active below ground, which is under the influence of Jupiter, Saturn and Mars. As far as plants are concerned, we can describe the former as leaf and blossom warmth and the latter as root warmth. These two kinds of warmth are totally different, so different that we might even say the above-ground warmth is dead while the underground warmth is living. <coughs> the underground warmth includes a definite life principle, something living is inherent in it, especially in winter. If we human beings had to experience the warmth that is active down below, we would all become exceedingly stupid, because in order to be smart we need to have dead warmth around our bodies. As soon as warmth is drawn into the earth by means of the lime in the soil, indeed wherever outer warmth passes over into inner warmth, this warmth becomes slightly enlivened. We are aware today of a difference between the air that is above ground and the air that is below ground. But we do not take into account the fact that warmth, too, is different above and below the Earth's surface. We know that the air below ground contains more carbon dioxide, while the air above ground contains more oxygen, but we don't really know why. The reason is that the air, too, takes on a slight degree of vitality when it is absorbed into the earth. It is the same with both warmth and air. They are both slightly enlivened when they are absorbed into the earth. It is different, however, with water and with the solid earth element. Both of these become even more dead inside the earth than they are outside it, but in losing something of their outer vitality, they free themselves from what is immediately above the earth's surface and become receptive to the forces coming from the most distant parts of the universe. <clears throat> In our present epoch, the time between January 15th and February 15th, is the time when it is easiest for them to be independent of the earth's immediate surroundings and come under the influence of the distant cosmic forces that are within the earth. 
These are things that will eventually become recognized as exact indications. For the mineral substances, midwinter is the time when the strongest formative forces, the strongest crystallizing forces, can develop within the earth. That is when the inner nature of the earth has the char characteristic of being least reliant on itself, on its mineral masses, and most under the influence of the crystal forming forces from the widths of the universe. The situation is this. The mineral substances of the earth have the greatest desire to be crystallized at the end of January and the deeper down you go, the stronger is their desire to become pure and crystalline. This is the time when what's going on in the mineral kingdom is most neutral as far as plant growth is concerned, when the plants are most self-absorbed in the earth and least exposed to the mineral substances. On the other hand, for a period of time before and after, especially before, when the minerals are just getting ready to become formed and crystalline. That is when the minerals radiate forces that are of particular importance for plant growth. Thus we can say, during the months of November and December, there is a time when what is beneath the surface of the earth has a particularly strong effect on plant growth. And so the question becomes, how can we put this knowledge to use? People will someday realize how important it is to take advantage of such things in order to be able to regulate the growth of plants. Let me remark here that if we are dealing with a soil that does not carry these influences upward during the winter, as it should, it is good to furnish the soil with some clay, the dosage of which I will indicate later. With the clay, we prepare the soil to conduct the crystalline force upward for the plant growth above the earth's surface. This force of crystallization, which is already apparent in the crystallizing snow, reaches its peak intensity in January or February and gets stronger and more intense the further down into the earth one goes. So you see, we can derive some very positive and truly helpful hints from information that initially seems far-fetched. Without such information, we would just be experimenting in the dark. We must realize that a given area of farmland, together with what's beneath the soil, forms an individuality that also exists in time, and that the life of the soil is especially strong in winter, while in a certain sense it tends to die down in summer. Now, especially in connection with agriculture, there is one thing I have often mentioned among anthroposophists that is extremely important to understand. It entails knowing under which conditions the universe and its forces can work upon earthly things. In order to understand this, let us take the seed-forming process as our starting point. We usually think of the seed from which the embryo develops as having an extremely complicated molecular structure, and we set great store in being able to understand it in all its complexity. We imagine molecules as having certain definite structures, simpler in the simple ones and getting ever more complicated, until we come to the incredibly complicated structure of a protein molecule. We stand there in wonder and astonishment in front of what we imagine to be the complex structure of the seed's protein. We're sure it has to be terribly complicated, because after all a new organism has to grow out of it. We assume that a whole new complicated organism is already inherent in the plant embryo in the seed, and that therefore this microcos excuse me, this microscopic or sub microscopic substance must also be incredibly complicated in its structure. To a certain extent this is true at first. When earthly protein is being built up, the molecular structure is indeed raised to the highest degree of complexity. But a new organism could never, never develop out of this complicated structure. That is not how a new organism comes about. The organism does not emerge from the seed in such a, a way that what was formed as seed out of the mother plant or mother animal 
simply continues on into what develops as the offspring. That's not true at all. The truth of the matter is that when this structural complexity of earthly matter has been taken to the ultimate degree, it then disintegrates, leaving in its place a miniature chaos. You could say it disintegrates into cosmic dust. And when the seed that was brought to the ultimate degree of complexity has disintegrated into dust and forms a miniature chaos, then the whole surrounding universe begins to work on the seed, to leave its imprint and to build up whatever can be built up by means of the influences coming from all sides of the universe. In the seed we have an image of the whole universe. Each single time a seed is formed, the earthly organizing process is led to its end, to the point of chaos. And each time within the seed chaos, a new organism is built up out of the whole universe. The parent organism simply has the tendency, through its affinity for a particular cosmic setting, to bring the seed into relationship with the forces from the proper directions so that what emerges from a dandelion is a dandelion and not a barberry. But the image reflected in the individual plant is always the image of some cosmic constellation and is built up out of the cosmos. If we ever want the forces of the cosmos to take effect in earthly substance, we have to drive this earthly substance as strongly as possible into chaos. This is what we must do whenever we want the universe to exert its influence. As far as plant growth is concerned, nature itself takes care of this in, in, in a certain respect. But since every new organism is built up out of the universe, it is also necessary to sustain this cosmic factor in the organism until seed formation is again present. Let us say we plant some kind of seed in the ground. There, in that seed, we have the imprint of the whole universe from some cosmic direction. A particular constellation takes effect in the seed, giving it its particular form. However, the moment the seed is planted in the ground and the external forces of the earth begin to work on it, it is filled with the urge to deny the cosmic factor, to grow rampantly in all directions because everything working above ground does not really want to maintain that form. Thus, once the seed has been driven to the point of chaos and then later begins to sprout, it is necessary to bring the earthly factor into the plant in contrast to the cosmic factor which lives as the form of the plant in the seed. We must help the plant draw nearer to the earth in its growth. This can only be done, however, by infusing the plant with life as it is already present on earth, that is, with life that has not yet reached the stage of complete chaos, the stage of seed formation, but has stopped at an earlier stage. And here nature helps out a lot in regions fortunate enough to be blessed with a rich formation of humus. Everything we can do artificially is only a poor second to the fertility the earth itself can provide. Humus formation occurs when something derived from plant life is incorporated into the general processes of nature, and this material that has not yet reached the point of chaos tends to push back the cosmic factor. If material like this is applied to growing plants, its effect is to anchor the actual earthly factor securely within the plant so that the cosmic factor is active only in the upward stream leading again to seed formation. The earthly factor, on the other hand, works in the development of leaves and flowers and so on. Into all this the cosmic factor only radiates its influences. This can be followed quite exactly. Assume you have a plant growing up from the root. A little seed kernel forms at the top of the stalk. The leaves and flowers spread themselves out. Now, what is earthly in the leaves and the flowers is their shape, and also the earthly matter that fills them out. So the reason why a leaf or kernel becomes plump, 
absorbs inner substantialities and so on, lies in what we bring to the plant as the earthly factor, as material that has not yet reached the point of chaos. In contrast, the seed which develops all its strength via the stalk, that is, in a vertical direction, not peripherally, this seed irradiates the leaves and blossoms with cosmic forces. This is a matter of direct observation. Just take a look at the green leaves of a plant. In their shape, their thickness, and their green color, a plant's leaves are the carriers of the earthly factor. However, they would not be green if the cosmic force of the sun were not living in them too. And when you get to the colored blossoms, it is not only the cosmic power of the sun that is active there, but also the support that the cosmic sun forces receive from the distant planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. For instance, if we look at a rose, we see the forces of Mars in its red color. <clears throat> Next look at a yellow sunflower. It is not quite right to call it a sunflower. We give it that name only because of its shape. It ought actually to be called a Jupiter flower on account of its yellow color, because the Jupiter forces supporting the sun are what bring out the white and yellow colors in flowers. And when we see a blue chicory flower, we must sense in its blue color the activity of Saturn, supporting the activity of the sun. So we definitely have the possibility of recognizing Mars in a red flower, Jupiter in a yellow or white flower, and Saturn in a blue flower, and in a green leaf we see the sun itself. What is visible in the coloration of a flower works especially strongly as a force in the root, for the living forces of the distant plants are active also within the soil. The situation is as follows. If we look at a plant that we have pulled up, then in the roots we have the cosmic factor, and in the flower primarily the earthly factor, with the cosmic factor present only in the delicate nuances of color. On the other hand, when the earthly factor is especially strong in the root, it then shoots into the form. The plant has its form from what can be developed. Excuse me, let me read that again. The plant has its form from what can develop in the earthly region. Everything that expands the form is earthly. When a root divides and branches, this is a sign that the earthly factor is working downward, just as the cosmic factor works upward into the color of the flowers. Thus with roots that are undivided, that are unitary, we have cosmic roots. With branching roots we have the effect of the earthly factor working into the soil, just as we have the cosmic factor working upward into the color of the flowers. The influence of the sun stands between the two, working primarily in the plant's green leaves and in the interplay taking place between the flowers and the roots. The sun thus corresponds to what we called the soil diaphragm. Whereas the cosmic factor is associated with the earth's interior and works upward into the upper part of the plant, the earthly factor is localized above ground but works downward, drawn into the plant with the help of substances like lime. Look at plants in which lime strongly pulls the earthly factor right down into the root. These are plants that send out branching roots in all directions like the good fodder plants, that is, plants like St. Foin, not like beets or turnips. Let me read that sentence again. These are plants that send out branching roots in all directions, like the good fodder plants, that is, plants like St. Foin, not like beets or turnips. Thus, if we want to learn to understand plants, we need to be able to tell from their form and from the color of their flowers to what extent cosmic and earthly factors are at work in them. Now, let us assume that we somehow manage to hold the cosmic factor in a plant strongly in check. In that case, it won't manifest itself much. It won't shoot into flower. It will, rather, manifest itself in something stem-like. As I told you earlier, the cosmic factor lives in the plant via silica. 
Just take a look at the Equisitum plant. It has an unusual ability to draw the cosmic into itself, to permeate itself with silica. It contains 90% silicic acid. In Equisitum, the cosmic is present to excess, but in such a way that it does not manifest in the flower, but shows up in the plant's growth lower down. Let's take another example. Suppose we want to hold in check everything that wants to stream upward through the stem into the leaves. <coughs> Suppose we want to keep it down below in the plant's root system. In our day and age this isn't so crucial because through various circumstances we have already established the different species of plants. But long ago in primeval times things were different. It was still easy to change one plant into another. In those days this sort of thing was extremely important, and it is still important today because we need to discover which conditions favor a particular plant. So what do we have to look for today? How do we have to look at a plant in which we want the cosmic force to stay down below instead of shooting up into the flowers and fruit? What do we have to do so that the process of forming stems and leaves is kept down below in the root system. We have to pla place this plant in sandy soil, because in sandy soil the cosmic is held in check, is really held fast. In the case of potato plants, we want to retain the flowering process down below in the actual potatoes, which are not roots at all but rhizomes, stems that have been held in check. To hold the cosmic force in check, we must plant our potatoes in a sandy soil. From all this we can see that the ABC of judging plant growth is always to know what is cosmic in a plant and what is terrestrial, earthly. We need to know how to adjust the composition of the soil so that the cosmic factor tends to become more dense, as it were, to be held back in the roots and leaves. Or, conversely, how to make it thinner so that it can be more readily sucked up into the flowers, giving them color, or into the fruits, permeating them with fine flavor. Just like the color of flowers, the fine taste of apricots or plums is a cosmic quality that has made its way up into the fruit. In every apple you are actually eating Jupiter, in every plum, Saturn. If we human beings, with what we know today, had to try to develop all the many modern varieties of fruits from the relatively few varieties of primeval times, we would not get very far. Fortunately for us, the forms of our different fruit varieties already became hereditary back in a time when humanity's instinctive primeval wisdom still knew how to create the various kinds of fruits out of the primitive varieties. If we didn't already have our different varieties of fruit, which we can propagate again and again through heredity, but found ourselves in the situation of having to recreate them all, we would not be able to accomplish much with our modern intelligence. Nowadays we do everything by trial and error, and don't at all enter into the process rationally. This is a fundamental prerequisite, however, that must be reacquired if we hope to continue at all in our work on the earth. What our friend Stegmann said about being able to notice a decline in the quality of agricultural products was very much to the point. This decline, like the transformation in the human soul itself, has to do with the Kali Yuga coming to an end in recent decades and in those to come. You can take this remark amiss or not as you wish. We are also faced with a great inner transformation in nature. The natural gifts naturally inherited knowledge, traditional medicines, and so on, that have been passed down from ancient times are all losing their value. We need to acquire new knowledge in order to be able to enter into all the interrelationships of these things. Humanity has only two choices, either to start once again in every field of endeavor, to learn from the whole of nature, from the relationships within the whole cosmos, or to allow both nature and human life to degenerate and die off. There is no other choice. 
Today, no less than in ancient times, we are in need of knowledge that can really enter into the inner workings of nature. People today have a vague idea of how air acts inside the earth. I spoke about this earlier. But they have practically no idea about what light does down there. They don't know that it is the cosmic silica bearing rocks and stones that take up the light in the earth and allow it to work there. While, on the other hand, humus, which is closely related to earthly life, neither takes up light nor allows it to become effective and thus engenders lightless activity. But these are things that need to be known and understood. Now, the plants growing on the earth are not the only things to consider. A certain complement of animal life also belongs to each region of the earth. For reasons that will become apparent, we can leave human beings out of the picture, but we cannot disregard the animals, because the best cosmic qualitative analysis, if I may put it like that, takes place in the interaction between the plants and animals of a given area. The strange thing is that if a farm has the right number of cows, horses, and other animals on it, the manure provided by these animals adds up to just the amount needed by the farm, just enough to give what has already reached the stage excuse me read that again, just enough to give what has already reached the stage of chaos. I would be glad if this statement were put to the test. I am sure experiments would confirm it. Further, if you have the right number of cow, horses, cows, pigs, the mixture of the manure will also be the appropriate one. This is due to the fact that the animals will consume the right amount of the plants that the land provides, and in the course of their metabolic processes will also produce just the right amount of manure that is necessary to return to the land. In principle, this can never be implemented completely, but it is correct in an ideal sense If farmers find it necessary to bring in manure from outside, they should only use and regard this as a remedy for a farm that has become ill. It is healthy only insofar as it supplies its own manure from its own animals. This means, of course, that we will have to develop a proper science of the number of animals of each kind needed for any given farm, and this will happen quite naturally as soon as as an understanding of the intrinsic forces becomes available again. An understanding of the animal organism belongs, of course, to what we said earlier about the farm as a totality, having its belly above ground and its head below. The animal organism is intimately involved in the whole household of nature. Thus, if we look at an animal with regard to its shape and coloration, and also the structure and consistency of its substance. We see the effects of Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars as we proceed from the animal's nose toward its heart, and the effects of Venus, Mercury, and Moon as we move beyond its heart toward its tail. People who are interested in these things should really develop their knowledge of how to observe form. It is really extremely important to develop this capacity, Go to a museum sometime and look at the skeleton of any mammal and keep the following in mind as you do. The primary influence at work in the formation of the head is the radiance of the sun, the direct radiation of the sun as it streams into the mouth. And depending on other conditions, which we will discuss later, one animal exposes itself to the sun differently than another. A lion exposes itself differently than a horse and it is this exposure that determines how the head and adjacent parts are formed. So at the front end of the animal we are dealing with the direct action of the sun in the forming of the head. Now you will recall that sunlight also approaches the earth in another way, by being reflected by the moon. We have to take into account not only the direct sunlight, but also the sunlight reflected by the moon. This reflected sunlight is quite ineffective when it shines on an animal's head. These things come into play during the animal's life as an embryo. But light reflected by the moon becomes highly effective when it falls on an animal's hind end. Look at the formation of the hind end of an animal, skeleton, and its characteristic relationship to the form of the head. Cultivate a sense for these contrasting forms, for the way the thighs are attached, the way the lower end of the digestive system is formed 
in contrast to the opposite pole, which is formed from the head inward. <clears throat> there, in an animal's front and hind ends, you have the contrast between the sun and the moon. If you follow this up, you will find that the sun's influence extends right up to the heart, just, excuse me, stopping just short of it. Let me read that again, I'm sorry. If you follow this up, you will find that the sun's influence extends right up to the heart, stopping just short of it, and that Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn work in forming the head and the blood, and that from the heart backwards, the influence of the moon is supported by Mercury and Venus. Thus, if you turn the animal so that its head sticks into the ground and its hind end sticks up, you then have the position that the agricultural individuality assumes invisibly. Looking at an animal's form in this way will enable you to discover a relationship, for example, between the manure that the animal provides and what is needed by the plant who... I'm sorry... Let me read that again. Looking at an animal's form in this way will enable you to discover a relationship, for example, between the manure that the animal provides and what is needed by the land whose plants the animal consumes. You must know, for instance, that the cosmic influences that come to expression in a plant come from the interior of the earth and are led upwards. Thus, if a plant especially rich in these cosmic influences is eaten by an animal, the manure that the animal's digestive system provides as a result of consuming such fodder will be just the right thing for the soil where that plant grows. You see, if you acquire insight into the, into the forms around you, you will discover everything that is needed in the self-contained individuality that a farm is. The animals must be included also. Music